first tonight. Thank you. That you're glad that that's taken care of and under it. Yes, um, we considered it a very formidable challenge and we worked very hard. To, and thanks to 200 uh, college student interns, we um, had a, and a good campaign team um, and a good message. But we had our interns who were everywhere knocking on doors, made over three million phone calls during the period of the campaign and showed that with good ground game you can do real well. So, but that's not your last... I have a general against Ian Kirkpatrick and we're looking forward to the next 64 days and pointing out the differences between the two of us and I hope it's a campaign that people can appreciate. What are some of the main differences that you see? Well, I think it's, it's I'm a Reagan, Lincoln, Republican, and she's very much aligned with Nancy Pelosi and the Democrats, whether it be on spending or whether it be on, for example, she voted for the Iranian deal, which I think was a disaster, giving the Iranians $100 billion or so to spend on their continuous behavior. Uh, she said that their vote on Obamacare was uh, the proudest vote of her career. Uh, Obamacare has now caused the people of Pinal County, for the first county in America, to be without a health care provider. I mean, that's remarkable. Obamacare is on the It was based on a false premise of taking money from young, healthy Americans and giving it to older, less healthy Americans. It's, it's been a total failure. Uh, I think uh, of service to the state. I, I'm proud of the mine in Superior and the road realignment in Tucson and fixing the fish hatchery in Mojave County and sponsoring the Yuma Heritage Crossing and so many other things. Support for Raytheon down in Tucson and yeah. Boeing that makes an Apache helicopter in Mesa and a number of other things. So, and I believe in this dangerous world compared uh, with because of a total failure of leadership. Barack Obama believes that leading from behind is America's role. That has been an abysmal failure. The world's on fire thanks to Barack Obama. And so we have a very different view about Barack Obama and his stewardship of America. So you feel that... I think you just take a glance at nine when he came to the presidency. You look at it now. We have ISIS metastasizing throughout the world. Every Muslim country, whether it be Indonesia or Malaysia or Africa, uh, the spread of ISIS continues. We've made some progress in beating back ISIS, but you still have a terrorist organization with a headquarters in a place called Raqqa. The Chinese are acting in the most aggressive fashion in asserting total illegal sovereignty over islands in the South China Sea. Russia is dismembering Ukraine. We've had 400,000 people killed and slaughtered by Bashar Assad. Uh, remember the President of the United States, not a matter of whether Bashar Assad will go but win. Do you remember when the president said ISIS was a JV? Do you remember when uh, the president uh, of the United States said we're leaving behind the freest, most democratic, most prosperous Iraq when he pulled everybody out? Now the trend in, in Afghanistan is against uh, ISIS, uh, the Taliban are making progress. So uh, the nation has been attacked twice, San Bernardino, Orlando been attacked. The director of the FBI and the, and the director of national intelligence uh, have said there will be further attacks on the United States of America. That was not possible in 2009 when Obama came to the presidency. I know that the foreign policy is one of your areas of strength and expertise yep. as is the military, but you are also very concerned about your local constituents, and I know that you were here just um, over the weekend for the dedication of Kayla's Playground. I see you have her bracelet on. And um, 
that you tried your hardest to help that family. I tried and traveled and did everything I could. And a couple of times I thought we were close, whether we actually were or not, I, I don't know. But I know this, that this young woman epitomizes the best in all of us. And she's a person that all of us want to be. She wanted to spend her life helping others. She went to a far off land, worked in a hospital to help the innocent who were being wounded in their terrible conditions. And she was made captive, treated unspeakably, and yet the letter she was able to smuggle out to her parents, which were parts of at the ceremony, are so gripping it makes me cry every time I read about it. And I did fail. And I'm sorry for that. I did fail because I really thought that maybe I could get her out. And so the turnout and the emotion and the people at Prescott there the dedication of that playground made me so proud. Made me proud of the people in Prescott who were so wonderful and so generous in their feelings and in their expressions about this wonderful young woman. And you know the two best people at the whole thing, as you know, Carl and Marsha, they handled themselves with such great class. Sure. Oh, thank you. Um, I hate so now, will you and Andrew T Patrick be having any kind of debates? Well, I'm, sure, I'm sure we'll have a couple of debates. If she shows up? <laughs> I, I'm sure we'll probably negotiate for something. Mm -hmm. um, she's a big supporter of Obamacare. Do you see any solutions to that situation other than scrapping it and starting over? I think there are parts of it that can be kept like the provision where you can keep your children on your health care policy until age 25. There are a few provisions. But as I mentioned to you before, the fundamental premise that you take money from younger, healthy people and give it to older, not less, uh, less well people is a flawed premise. And so it was doomed to failure. It's the first reform uh, that's ever been enacted by Congress on a strictly partisan vote. There was not a single Republican vote for Obamacare. Every other reform, there's always been a bipartisan approach to it. So it was doomed to failure, and now we have 10,000 of our fellow citizens in Pinal County who are without a health care. I remember. And, and, and Kirkpatrick still supports that. I remember when you came to Prescott and you had a stack of papers for Obamacare that was about yay hot, and before it was even passed, and you warned people that this was not going to work. And what you said was pretty accurate. Um, what, what are the people of Pinellas County going to do? That's a great question because we have to help them. But right now, under the present situation, we can't. But Pinell County is the lead dog. They are the first county, not the only county. There will be many others. And we will have to do something. You know what's entertaining to me now is that they're saying, oh, we'll have to get the Republicans in. We'll all work together and fix these problems with Obamacare. Really? They didn't allow a single amendment to be voted on on the floor of the United States Senate when we took it up. And they rammed it through a, on a strictly partisan basis. Now they want us to help, our help to fix it. What we want is their help for us to fix it. Well, I know that Congressman Gosar said that he has um, a plan and a bill. There are plans out there. And we have the outlines of a plan that we Republicans in the Senate can, can propose, whether it be 
risk pools for those with pre-existing conditions, to going across state lines, to have insurance policies, to being able to import drugs from Canada, to all kinds of reforms that we could do, which would replace, basically replace Obamacare. Another hot topic this election seems to be immigration. Mm -hmm. What What is your state current stand on that? What do you think needs to be done? How do we, I don't know that the issue will ever be solved, but how do we start to address it? Well, we have to secure our border. We have the capabilities to do so, but they're technical. In other words, use drones to secure, to surveil the border. Continue construction of towers that we have across our southern border, which give a picture of the entire border. Use technology as opposed to just manpower. We need additional border patrol. In fact, our proposal was for 20,000 additional border patrol. But we have to have a secure border. But then we have to have E-Verify, which means that anyone who is trying to get a job in this country has to have a document that shows that they're here legally, that they show the employer when they go for a job. Anyone who employs someone without any verify is going to be prosecuted. They're going to be in violation of the law. It's a long, hard path to citizenship. Pay back taxes, uh, learn English, uh, pay fees to pay for their path to citizenship, get in, behind, get in line behind everybody else when you get a green card. We can do that, and um, uh, it's, it's obviously doable. But what's not doable is rounding up 11 million people and putting them across the southern border. That's not doable. Uh, and of course, not to mention what it would do uh, in many other aspects. So I'm hoping that after the dust settles this year, this election, that we can go back and address the issue which obviously has a first and leading component, border security, but you also then are left with 11 million people who are in this country illegally. By the way, 40% of those who are in this country illegally never crossed our border illegally. They had a visa, and they came here with a visa that has since expired. That's why the E-Verify program is so important. So there's two different presidential candidates. Mm -hmm. you know. yep. Who do you think you can work with the best on the topic of immigration? Donald Trump. I'm sure that, that I can work with Donald Trump. I can work with any president because that's my job. I can work with any president. And I am still very offended that Hillary Clinton would lie about what she said to the family of a young man who was killed in Libya standing next to his coffin and then saying that his family misunderstood. That's a lie. Well, well they were next to the coffin, flag draped coffin of their son. That's disgraceful. Hillary doesn't have the reputation for being the most truthful of people anyway. I, how does that play in foreign policy? I believe that we are now seeing a phenomenon in American politics we've never seen before. Both candidates with the highest disapproval. Both candidates Americans don't trust. So the one who is elected is going to have to do something to change that. Because if the American people don't trust a president, they're not going to follow that president's lead. So I would argue that bipartisanship would be important for the next president to address, for example, have you met any American who doesn't want tax reform? Of course not. So why wouldn't that president call together some Republicans and Democrats and say, every American wants to reform the tax code. It's this high. Nobody understands it. So let's sit down together and fix it. So if, if you're digging for the pony, and I'm digging, then there is a chance for some bipartisanship. It's not an accident that only 14% of the American people approve of Congress. There hasn't been much bipartisanship the last eight years, that's for sure. Well, there's bipartisanship on one committee, the Armed Services Committee. We 
we pass bills out that are signed by the president, we have them approved and signed by the president, because it's so important to provide the men and women who are serving in the military with the talent, with the capabilities, with the equipment, and with the pay and benefits that they have earned. So there is that one area, and I'm proud that the Democrat, senior Democrat on the committee and I work closely together, and we pass it out unan almost unanimously, and it, we get it through the United States Senate. But you're right, on all the, all, practically all the other issues, no bipartisanship. How supportive is the president in supporting those issues from your committee? He's fought us every step of the way. The president has disagreed with the reforms that we have made. He uh, uh, won't support our increases in spending on defense, but he knows that if he vetoed the bill, it would be overridden because we pass it through the Senate by 88 votes. So he's stuck. Kind of a nice feeling to yes. get him stuck every once in a while. Uh, <laughs> yeah. You know, no, it actually is disappointing because I think that he would care more about the military. Some people think that he should maybe care more even about Arizona. Well, me or he? The president. Oh, yeah. So assuming you get re-elected in November, what what are your goals? What are you going to tackle next? Well, first of all, national defense, because we have cut back on spending, and we now have a lot of planes that won't fly, and a lot of ships that can't sail, and we're starting to see erosion of a lot of talented people leaving the military. So national security, try and get a strategy of which there is now none to defeat ISIS, try to get a policy concerning cyber attacks and start addressing that issue, but also continue to support the projects that are important to Arizona. Fire and water are our two greatest challenges. We have to have forest thinning. We have to get rid of the salt cedar. We have to uh, understand that we, may have, we will have to, over time, reuse our water. We have to work all together because if we don't, then we're going to face a water shortage that will change the lives of our children and our grandchildren. That is really one of my very highest priority. 20% of Arizona's national forest have been consumed by fire in the last 10 years. We can't have that continue. We have to fight fires. We have to thin our forests. We have to have biomass. We have to do a lot of things as we face the crisis of fire and water for Arizona in the 21st century. Well, I'm just going to throw a few quick topics out All there. Right. Okay. Charter schools is one of the answers. <coughs> Charter schools have succeeded. They fail. The ones that fail go out of business. That's, that's unique. Uh, I believe that parents should have a choice. I believe it's important the legislation of education reform we passed and was signed by the president. It gives more authority and responsibility back to the states where it belongs, state and local authorities. And I'm proud that uh, Arizona State University, University of Arizona, NAU, and our community colleges and Grand Canyon University and others are so are doing so well. I note that Arizona State University was judged last year as the most innovative university in America. Uh, so I'm proud of our higher education in Arizona. Um, but do we have to continue to work and work hard? Yes. Legalization of marijuana? I believe that it's a gateway drug and I will respect the vote of the people of Arizona, but I hope they would look at what's happening up in Denver. Cindy and I have friends that live in Denver that say there's a park where people used to come and enjoy each other and recreation, and now it's a zombie park. Uh, I believe that marijuana is a gateway drug, and uh, 
and I'm convinced of that by experts. But as I say, I will respect the, the verdict of the American people, of the people of Arizona on the ballot initiative. Abortion. Well, I've been pro-life for all my political career. I believe that life begins at conception, and I have believed that we ought to preserve the rights of the unborn. Taxes. You say you want to reform them, but how? Well, we should have a simpler, fairer tax code. We should eliminate most of those deductions which are unnecessary. I don't know most of them. We ought to clean it up, make it simpler. There should be three tax brackets, period. Uh, we should make sure that so many of these special interest tax carve-outs carve are eliminated. We need a tax code that the average American can sit down and read and understand. When we reach that level, you will take a giant step in restoring the confidence of the American people in their government. What about companies like Apple who have billions and billions of dollars over them to bring it home? That's because we need to reform the highest corporate tax rate in the world, which is 35%. And of course they're going to leave it parked over there because over there they can spend, build, and invest without paying for that 35% tax rate. What we ought to do is say, okay, Apple, you bring that everybody else. It's a trillion and a half, by the way. You bring it back to the United States and you promise to create jobs and hire people and invest and we'll give you a 15% tax rate. And I bet you that there are companies and corporations that are overseas that would jump at it. So I've asked you a lot of questions. What do you want to add? Uh, it's been a great honor in my life to have served in the House and the Senate representing the people of Arizona. I've enjoyed it. It's the most diverse and beautiful state in America. The people of Arizona have been incredibly good to me, and I look forward to serving another term. And I do that because I think I can help the state of Arizona more than anyone else, and I believe that this nation is at greater risk than it's been since the end of World War II. And I believe that I have the experience and knowledge and background to help secure the safety of our citizens. Thank you. Oh, I just, sure. In the words of Chairman Mao, it's always darkest before it's totally black. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you so much. Okay. It's always good to Thank see you. you. Good to see you.